Yale dominated the first 30 years of American football, like the only big boy playing with a bunch of kids. But by 1910, the kids were coming of age. Yale was playing with equals and had to take the bitter with the sweet. Maybe the Bulldog helped the kids too much. More than 50 alumni became head coaches at other colleges, colleges which eventually became football powers themselves. The immediate thorn in Yale's side, however, was Percy Houghton, Harvard's first paid coach. And everything he learned from Yale, he learned as an opponent. Year after year, Yale's hopes were wrecked by Houghton. In the meantime, Yale's system of graduate coaches got entirely out of hand. In 1912, no fewer than 27 old blues turned up to outnumber the varsity they were supposed to coach. So in 1913, Yale hired Howard Jones, and Frank Hinkey took over in 1914. Hinkey brought the lateral pass to its highest development. And while finishing touches were being put on the bowl, brought the team through in good style right to the Harvard game, beating Notre Dame and Princeton on the road. But on the day the bowl was dedicated, disaster struck. 71,000 people, the largest crowd which had ever assembled in a modern amphitheater, were on hand. But Harvard, led by Captain Charlie Brickley, broke the game open in the first period. Yale's best chance to score fizzled after Harry Lagore spearheaded a drive to the Harvard four-yard line, when N. Jeff Coolidge grabbed a fumble and ran 98 yards for Harvard's third score. The papers said it. Yale had the bowl, but Harvard had the punch. 36 to nothing. In 1916, things looked up. With Tad Jones as head coach, Yale had her best team since Coy, and they were determined to end the long string of disappointments against Harvard. The Crimson, as usual, gave them plenty of trouble and got off to a three to nothing lead. Led by Captain Cupid Black, wearing number one, Yale's first number, the powerful blue line, Mosley, Gates, Fox, Callahan, Church, and Comerford, stopped the Crimson attack. And the famous French backfield, Lagore number 19, Jakes number 20, LaRoche number 27, and Neville number 23, ground out a touchdown. carrying over on fourth down from the one foot line. Enough to win, six to three. It looked like the beginning of good times again, but the next year there was a different kind of a scrap. On the campus there were drills faintly reminiscent of football. But aside from informal games, nothing on the gridiron until 1919. Army's first visit to New Haven came in 1921. That year, the cadets marched to the game, although in later years they took the open trolleys, which long remained the traditional way to get to the bowl. For 25 years, the West Pointers provided one of the most colorful events of the season. By now, the play was opening up, and both sides passed often, although Tad Jones attacked was based mainly on power plays, and the pass was used as an auxiliary weapon. Holman, Blair, and the rest of the line covered Captain Mac Aldrich's punts closely.
Aldrich intercepted a pass to set up Yale's first score. Pass to Cam Beckett for the first touchdown. And kick the point. Later, a touchdown by Charlie O'Hearn made it Yale 14, Army 7. In 1923, Jones really got the material he needed for his power-laden single-wing offense. Ends, Dick Luman and Shep Bingham. Tackles, Ted Blair and Century Milstead. Guards, Tex Diller and Dick Eckhart. Center, Wynn Lovejoy. Left halfback, Mal Stevens and Witty Neal. Right halfback, Ducky Pond and Newell Neidlinger. Quarterback, Lyle Richeson and Russ Murphy. And at fullback, Captain Bill Mallory. They entered the Princeton game with six straight wins. The game started with a kicking duel. And the line covered Neal's punts beautifully. In the second quarter, Mal Stevens went from the Princeton 45 to the 26 to set up a field goal by Mallory. Early in the second half, Princeton broke through as Neal tried to punt, and heads up, Woody tucked the ball under his arm and ran to the 33. Soon after, Stevens broke loose for a beautiful 44-yard run to the Princeton 26-yard line. Neidlinger carried 14 yards to the 12. wide to the three. And Neidlinger bowled over for the score. To set up the final touchdown, Stevens intercepted a pass on the 25. Neinliger and Stevens carried for a first down on the 15. Stevens took it to the 10. And on the next play, Neidlinger went all the way. Yale 27, Princeton nothing. Truly a great team. The next week, Harvard Stadium was a sea of mud and water, and undefeated Yale feared a freak loss. But in the second quarter, Mallory slammed into Harvard's Dolph cheek, and Ducky Pond, picking up the fumble, justified his nickname as the papers said, swam 67 yards to victory, with Woody Neal following after. Third quarter, Ted Blair blocked a Harvard punt and recovered it. And Mallory kicked two beautiful field goals, fine centering by Lovejoy, sure handling by Neidlinger, and Mallory literally digging the ball out of the slime. The game ended in a downpour, Yale 13, Harvard nothing, unbeaten and untied, a record that lasted 38 years. In 1924, only ties by Strong Army and Dartmouth teams marred the record for Captain Win Lovejoy's men. And again, a downpour flooded the Harvard game. Gerke, with some fine running and two field goals, quickly put Harvard ahead, six to nothing. A dangerous lead on the slippery field. But in 
the second half, Dick Lumen recovered a fumbled punt at midfield, and Pond and Klein started ripping up the Harvard line. Klein for 10. Pond for 6. And so down the field with Pond bucking for the touchdown. Harry Scott added the point. Later in the period, Lumen tackled Safford and forced a fumble, which Gill carried to the Harvard 14. Pond and Klein again showed why Tad Jones favored a basic power attack. Pond five. Climb five. Climb three, and climb for the score. Yale 19, Harvard six. Next year, Yale's football fortunes declined again. The Riven Poofs remained cheerful in their annual show for children at the Brown game. They even staged a cross-channel swim in emulation of one of the fads of the middle 20s. But by 1927, the critics were howling at Tad Jones, and the papers predicted Yale would lose five major games. Jones and Captain Bill Webster's squad had different ideas. A forward pass in the Georgia game took end Stu Scott inches out of the end zone, and those few inches were all that stood between the team and an undefeated season. Against Army, Bruce Caldwell proved himself one of the great backs in Yale history. Twice, Army's stars, Chris Cagle, Light Horse Harry Wilson, and Johnny Merle, brought the ball to Yale's goal line. But the Yale line, with three All-Americans, Webster, Quarrier, and Charlesworth, held. Fullback Eddie Decker made one saving tackle. In the shadow of the goalpost, Stu Scott bet Wilson that Army wouldn't score. And Caldwell broke up a pass to stop the second assault and win Scott's bet for him. On the offense, Caldwell, number 48, ran with tremendous power and figured in all Yale's scores. the wind and a 33 yard tackle eligible pass to Sid Quarrier who yanked the ball away from the defender and fought his way across the goal line. try for point. Yale 10, Army 6. On the eve of the Princeton game, a bombshell broke. Caldwell was declared ineligible on a technicality. Students demonstrated wildly. But with Caldwell on the bench, few gave Yale a chance. And things looked bad right into the last quarter. Princeton's Whitmer scored early. White Fishwick kept hope alive by blocking the try for point. Later, Johnny Hoban passed to Stu Scott to start a drive. And Eddie Decker, number 42, gained well on several plays. But 
Dr. Johnny Garvey carried to the three. Yale's best chance fizzled. And hope faded as the clock ticked off the last quarter. Then, on fourth down, with only minutes to go, Hoban faded almost to midfield. And Fishwick, cutting to the left, took the pass in stride. And pandemonium broke loose. As Cox kicked the point to put Yale ahead, the roar grew even louder. The final score was Yale 14, Princeton 6. Against Harvard, Garvey ran 52 yards for the first touchdown. And Bill Hammersley went 42 to close Tad Jones's career with a 14 to nothing victory. Of Tad, a former Harvard captain said, in nine years that Tad Jones has coached, no Yale man has ever performed an unsportsmanlike act against Harvard. It is a pleasure that he has closed out his fine career with a team that is a credit to him and Yale. <laughs>